Aloha, and welcome to What's Bugging You, brought to you by Hawaii's leader in pest control and the first company in Hawaii to earn the National Quality Pro Certification, Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Now, here's the host of our show, Mike Buck. You know, I don't have to ask you if something's bugging you, but we do have to find what it is. I mean, if you live in paradise like we do, something is bugging you. That's a fact. And it keeps the pest control uh, business going, but also it, it, it really puts a lot of damper on your life. And we're going to talk about any kind of thing today that, that applies to that. Michael Both is with us. Uh, we, we try to start our program, What's Bugging You, by letting you know that you can always uh, get in touch with us on the website at sandwichisle.com, uh, that you can get online and you can see a lot of these things happening. But mostly, we try to bring you up to speed on what's going on as we speak. And uh, we sort of got into the program in the last uh, couple of months of getting you some pest news. And and I guess, Michael, the biggest the thing this week, again, is uh, is the the bugging people is mosquitoes, of all things. Yeah, Mike, that, that's right. So <clears throat> we spoke about this the last couple of weeks, and the, the story really began in Maui when there was that news story about uh, how mosquitoes are overwhelming uh, Maui residents. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's kind of grown since then. Um, the Navy, there was a story about the Navy that uh, teamed up with Department of Health to defend um, residents against mosquitoes. And then uh, the most recent story um, a couple of days ago was the state uh, planning to hire more vector control workers. So um, this mosquito and potential mosquito-borne disease issue is mm-hmm. a very big issue you presently. Know, but but I'm, I'm puzzled because, you know, we've known each other for a long time and we've done a lot of things together in business. And I'm wondering what prompts these outbreaks or uprisings. In other words, you would expect that the mosquito population is static, but that may not be true. Maybe too much moisture, maybe there's too much sitting water out. What what causes a, a uptick in the, in the problem? So that, that that's a great question, and it, it's one that the state responded by saying that there's cycles. And mm-hmm. so what we've observed from the management point of view is that there are definitely cycles with uh, mosquitoes, <clears throat> and they, they aren't necessarily at the same time every year. So mm-hmm. it seems to be more related to water. And so some months are wetter than other months for the same period of the year. And, and so what mosquitoes need is uh, most mosquitoes need water to breed in. Mm-hmm. And so providing there's water, in, and we all know how much it rains in Hawaii, especially on the windward side of the island. So when you have a lot of high rainfall, then you have a lot of mosquito um, egg laying and uh, production. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a result of that, you start seeing more mosquitoes around. Okay. Now, I know that they can be th- – quite upsetting to some. And I, I showed you uh, the other day when I was mentioning on my regular program, we were talking about mosquitoes. And I said, wait until Michael Botha gets this, because one of my listeners emailed me a photograph from the Big Island. Yes, yeah, so we're and, looking and, at that right now. Yeah, it's, and it's let me the size you, of gang, a quarter. Yeah, it's, right? it's, it's uh, <laughs> it, for, for uh, to put a perspective on it, he took a picture of this insect next to a quarter, and it's fully as large as a quarter. And you said it is a type of mosquito. It's, well, mosquitoes are in a family of flies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the order is called diptera, which basically means die, two. Ptera means wings. Mm-hmm. And so flies and mosquitoes are both diptera. They're both okay. two wings. And they have, um, for example, uh, termites and ants, they have four wings. Okay. Where, where the two additional wings would be, they have little things called heltiers, which are little stubs that stick out. So okay, now you can't see these when they're flying by. No, it's guys can't. like you that know but, these things right, but, under but, a microscope. But the key yeah. thing here is that uh, mosquitoes and flies are on the same order. Mm-hmm. And so this thing, even though it looks exactly like a giant mosquito that's yeah. the size of a quarter, is actually a crane fly. And, okay, uh, now, what about some of the factoids that people seem to embrace and, and, and think are a fact? From what I understand, mosquitoes, number one, they don't have a real long lifespan. Is that correct? Well, it depends on the species. Some oh, are right? longer than others, yeah. So um, some of them are really short, like like certain flies, but others last much longer. In mm-hmm. fact, when you say so, short, you mean you're talking about several days or several weeks? Uh, weeks, maybe. Yeah, and, yeah. Okay. And some of them will last longer than that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but here's here's an interesting thought. Mosquitoes are irritating because they bite you, right? Yeah. So guess who bites you? The female. Of course. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so only the female bites you. The I male, knew it. I knew it. <laughs> the male doesn't bite you. The male is just less. irritating yeah, as heck. Yeah, yeah. But the, um, the, the females are the ones that have to get a blood meal in order mm. to lay eggs. Ah, and okay. So, so that's the whole situation. So when you're getting bit by a mosquito, it's actually been bit by a female mosquito because she needs that blood meal in order to have eggs. How do they expand their territory? Because another thing that you're told a lot is that they never – 
they don't venture very far from where they live. They live and die sort of in the same area. But what about a big wind? Does it, like yep. termites, doesn't it blow mosquitoes all over the place? Well, they, none of them are strong flyers. So mm-hmm. they're, they're definitely affected by winds and certainly trade winds. But the key thing, there's two different types of, of mosquitoes, basically broad categories. You have day-body mm-hmm. mosquitoes and you have night-body mosquitoes. And, and, and both poor of guys that they have both, right? What <laughs> exactly. Oh, we all, we all yeah. do, I think. Yeah, yeah. But uh, basically... The, the key differentiation here is going back to the, the, the flight range. The day body mosquitoes only have about a 100 to 150 yard range, which means that their presence at your home usually indicates mm-hmm. a source nearby. And mm-hmm. so they normally live in clear water. So okay. rainwater that's collected in a pail, um, the bottom of a, a, a potted plant or something like that. So they prefer clear water. Mm-hmm. Then you have the night biting mosquitoes, which don't necessarily have to have standing water. So those can actually breed in damp soil. Oh, boy. So those ones are often found, like if you're ever hiking through a valley, and mm-hmm. you get to a, a, a valley that gets a lot of drainage, but n- not necessarily standing water, and there's just bazillions of mosquitoes everywhere. Well, those are the night body mosquitoes usually. You know, as you know, in, in Alaska, they call it the state bird. I mean, I've been up, right. uh, fishing in Alaska where they're just so aggressive. And so now, but, but here, the, here's the thing. A lot of people say they don't get affected. But from what I understand, everybody gets bitten, but some people don't react. In other words, you know, or or or, you know, my, or is, is, <clears throat> some people don't get bitten. Um, yeah, I don't think I get bitten. I don't. I, I don't yeah. remember ever having a mosquito bite. Well, I, I used to have that problem, yeah. but now, mm-hmm. now I do get bitten. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I can. Yeah. I, I, some people just don't get bitten. Now, it, there is some science behind um, the thought that. Mosquitoes are actually attracted to certain odors on okay. a person. So odors that people give off are attractive to mosquitoes or not, right. not attractive. So, for example, have you ever noticed that you get bit on your feet more often than not? So people who get bit by mosquitoes, they, they're at a barbecue or something like that, and, and they'll find all the mosquito bites on their feet. On their feet. And the reason for that is mosquitoes are attracted to the, the scent that comes from from, feet, from wherever, probably from, your from feet. sweat, yeah, yeah, yeah from bacteria. Yeah. <laughs> hey, but you know, l- so, let me tell you something. Before we trivialize this, because I know we're not doing this, uh, it, it, you you let me know that there sometimes it, it becomes such a big problem that you got to get a vector control. In this case, you, you got a story about the Navy actually getting proactive because they must recognize there's a problem. Otherwise, why are they going to waste the resource? Yeah. So the Navy got involved because they have the joint base right near the airport. Yeah. <clears throat> now the Department of Health, as I understand it. Um, primarily sets up mosquito traps. Um, the traps are there to monitor for the presence of um, native species and also mm-hmm. non-native species because they want to know what type of mosquitoes are coming into oh, the state. Oh, okay, sure. Then Identify them right on the spot. what type of diseases we may have. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the Navy, um, with its proximity to the airport, um, it was a natural fit, I think, mm-hmm. and they have their own entomology staff that does this kind of thing. So okay. they, uh, what I understand of it is that they have a joint venture where they're both monitoring together, and uh, mm-hmm. they have plans to perhaps extend that beyond just the bases and the airport. The Department of Health, who I believe had something like 58 employees at its, at its peak, um, uh, who were involved in the vector control unit, um, now I have about 20-something. Yeah, that's very scary yeah. because the problem hasn't gone away. Just the inspectors have. Yeah, you or know. The, the workers, you know. Well, well yeah. that's the thing. And I, mm. honestly, I don't know how efficient they were or exactly mm. what they mm. did. But still, you've got to think that the efficiency has gone down because they've got less employees. But um, <clears throat> those employees are charged with two things. Monitoring for the presence mm-hmm. um, of, of mosquitoes and identifying the various different species of mosquitoes. And then administering treatment to those areas. Is that the same guy doing that? In, in, in many that's cases? Yeah. 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 So mm. this is my thought. If they're understaffed, mm-hmm. why slow the whole process down? Do what they're good at, do the monitoring, mm-hmm. and have private industry respond and you know, take care it, of the problem. It, absolutely. We, we in, in, other words, in other words, here you go, Sandwich Isle. Here's a list of where the problem is. Go fix it. That's what we you all know, do. And that's what you do. You fix it. That's what people yeah. do. You know? But, so, you know, what, I, what I'm really, really worried about in, in that area is that the problem hasn't gone away, just the monitoring of it has. So that, that's kind of scary, isn't it? That's right. And so yeah. one thing for sure is that the problem hasn't gone away. Mm-hmm. And so I, I personally think that any time you're dealing with a public health type issue um, you, and, and vectors of certain diseases, you, you need, need to act quickly. So I think they should really expand their um, monitoring to new areas to make sure that we know mm-hmm. exactly what we've got. And then when they have a problem, don't waste their time trying to staff up to get it. Just yeah. get a company that's already staffed up and, and, and able to respond within 24 hours. One would think 
that if you just take a look at it from a financial management standpoint, that it would be a much more efficient way. Not to say that we go privatize everything the government does, but certain c- certain functions would would eliminate the minutia of dealing with the problem once the problem has been identified. Because your people, that's what they do. They deal with the problem all day. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and yeah. a lot of the mosquito equipment is um, basically a, the gas-powered blowers mm-hmm. <clears throat> that aerosolize liquid into very small particles. Mm-hmm. And so those that type of equipment requires a lot of maintenance. Mm-hmm. Now you've got nozzles that corrode. You've got the, the gas engines that need to be run regularly. Otherwise, the carburetors don't work. So there, there's a whole bunch of little details. I know what you're, you're getting at because the private company that's got you money invested in this stuff, they're going to keep that stuff in top shape. Exactly. So yeah. the state has to invest a huge amount of money yeah, in these yeah. things. And then they you can't just let them stand. So I would imagine yeah. that they have to continually replace all of that stuff. Um, and it's a lot of it's yeah, a you know, and it, it, it takes, I guess, stories like that popped up this last week to call attention to it. Maybe some of those in that big square building will say, hey, we got to do something about this. Let's propose something. Well, you know, I'm normally very supportive of, of the state and, and especially with regards to uh, quarantine work and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. But I think in this particular case, <clears throat> they need to think outside the box a little. And um, I think that they should engage the experts that are licensed and mm-hmm. practicing this every single day and be able to respond much quicker that way. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, let's make sure that we cover the bases. And, and one of the big bases, particularly in this last year, has been this this seemingly exponential spread of the bed bug issue. And I mean, oh, you know, really. it used to be, I, I remember you had a great ad for Sandwich Island last mm-hmm. year that you used to get one or two calls a month, and then it went up to several a day. Now that is a geometric progression. Yeah, over 10 a day is what we Yeah, that's right unbelievable. So let me tell you a story. <clears throat> so we have our bed bug supervisor, we actually have a bed bug division, right? So the bed bug supervisor, his family's in from out of town. Uh-oh. So he's set up a suite at one of the hotels that mm-hmm. we service in mm-hmm. Waikiki. Beautiful hotel. And, and any, any, any hotel has to have some sort of service, right? Sure. So he checks into the room, and what does he find as he gets in there? He finds a bed bug. Yeah, that's Not, not just, just one, but a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the funniest thing was, was he hasn't had a vacation for probably a year. And he takes a vacation. This was going to be a a cruise in the hotel. And what do you do? Roll your sleeves up, get to work. And he had to call his guys and tell them what to do and which room it was in. And we went out and sorted the problem out. No, it's not the hotel's fault. Yeah. Because the hotels don't put the bed bugs there. You know, you've. The bed bugs come on on tourists. You know, you've mentioned this before. Many of the companies that you work with and monitor uh, situations, you deal with it, it's gone. But the very next day, Somebody else can come in this and is, bring the problem right back. This in is there. it, you know. The the thing about bedbugs, I feel so sorry for hotels and restaurants because restaurants get hit by bedbugs too. Mm-hmm. What what do you what can you do to protect yourself <clears throat> from a bug that doesn't crawl, doesn't fly, doesn't hop or jump? You think how's it get around? Only transported on, me, on know? humans. Yeah, it's yeah. transported by the guests that you're trying to please, who then sue you because they get bit by a bedbug. <laughs> <Jeez. laughs> you know, so, go back to where we were a moment ago. Though you, we we're talking about mosquitoes, and I know that a lot of people feel good, whether it's a restaurant or a piece of property mm-hmm. that have the zapper that you can hear going off, whether it be mosquitoes or termites or whatever. Right. You think, well, that's getting them all. I, I know it doesn't, but but it does make people feel good. But People don't want to see that in a hotel or in a restaurant. They don't want to be reminded that there are bugs there. So what do you do? Yeah, you know, the, what most hotels do, I, I would say the majority of hotels that I'm aware of in mm-hmm. Waikiki, for example, <clears throat> they all have a, a preventative program. Yeah. So they, they educate their staff. <clears throat> the staff are very often paid an incentive to report any unusual blood stains or anything on the sheet um, so that a manager gets pulled in to, to check to see if it is bed bugs. And uh, then they respond very quickly. Most hotels, if they have a guest, whether it's verified or not, yeah. if, the, if the guest complains of bed bugs, they move them to another room, they'll call out a company like ours, we'll go out there, we'll inspect it usually within hours and determine if it is bed bugs. If it is, they treat it straight away. You know, Michael, I saw something the other day that was alarming, and I couldn't wait to do the show to ask you about this. Uh, sometimes we look at how much it, it costs. You know, you, you go on Travago or trip this, and, and you try to get a good deal on a room. Mm. Um, I'm thinking that because of the conditions that exist in resort areas like Hawaii, that a lot of this room rate has got to be a provision that the management company is doing to take care of things like bed bugs because they know they're going to have to spend money on, on, on prevention or treatment and prevention. I'm sure it is, and uh, you know the the fact is uh, a lot of it's got to do with people who are dishonest about yeah. bed bugs, and you know so sometimes people try and play a game where they claim they've been bit by a bed bug or seen a bed wow. bug, so they can get a room upgrade, oh, which, is, which is just yeah. so wrong. Yeah, yeah. 
and the the hotels in there do their best efforts to pacify those customers mm-hmm. and make them you know make it right end up losing their shirt on it yeah um so what we've observed recently though is a huge increase in bed bugs and not just hotels i would say the majority is residential actually hotels being in this particular case a much smaller demand for i was reading something the other day before we move along here that was indicative of one family uh that used to travel the the father is a traveling guy in his business and he took his family with him but every time they did that somebody got bitten or somebody and they they just stopped traveling because they're just so concerned about a little tiny thing like a bed bug well i tell you a little tiny thing like a bed bug causes such a nightmare yeah. the big problem with bed bugs is that they are probably the single most expensive bug to eradicate yeah because that's it is amazing such an intensive yeah. program because imagine you've seen how tiny those bugs are on their eggs yep now let's say you have a three thousand square foot house with four bedrooms and two bathrooms and two lounges mm-hmm. you've got to go through every inch of that house Mm-hmm. to find all the bed bugs, all the eggs, and kill them all. And, and it's not a one service thing because they lay eggs, and uh, you have to wait for the eggs to hatch. So you've got to come back multiple times <laughs> to treat it. So it's a very, very expensive and difficult treatment to do. And so when you do get bed mm-hmm. bugs, you absolutely have to act quickly. The longer you wait, the worse the problem becomes and the more expensive it is to solve the problem. Okay, so since we talked about, uh, first of all, the mosquitoes that fly. Now, the bed bugs, they don't fly. They just make you want to fly <laughs> away from where they are. That's right. Uh, what about the old standard standby? I mean, you know, it, it, it used to be sandwich al termite a long that, time ago. Right, now yeah. it's sandwich al pest solutions. But I do know that this is the time of the year, and for some reason, whether it's El Nino or whatever, we seem to have more swarming going on. What's happening and where are they? So I agree with you. I, I, I've i been here 24 years, and mm. I don't ever recall there being mm. such strong swarms in the last 10 years. And so mm. this week we've had dry wood termite swarms, not not subterranean, but we've had dry wood termite swarms um, almost every single night. Yeah. Is and, there any uh, part of the island where they're more prevalent or you get more calls well, from? We're getting a lot of calls on the North Shore and the mm. windward side. Windward, huh? And so yeah. windward from the you know very bottom of the island all the way up yeah. to the North Shore. And so... Um, yeah, it, it, and that's dry wood termites, right? So mm-hmm. um, dry wood termites and subterranean termites often swarm at the, at the same time. But the difference really is is that when you have subterranean ter- termite swarms, you have huge clouds of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, usually they're outside. Dry mm-hmm. wood termite swarms, often there's just a few of them, and people will find them inside. And, and usually that's because they're inside their house. You know, what happens in the swarming week or the swarming season? I mean, at nighttime, they're all over the place. Are it, it, and you don't you don't see them swarming during so the daytime. Pretty interesting. So Where the, are they? The 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 termites will actually sit. Let's say it's subterranean termites. They'll make these little things called swarming slits, which is mm-hmm. like a little mud slit, mm-hmm. and all of the alates or the winged reproductives, as they're called, um, will line up along those slits, and you'll have a couple of them sticking the antenna out, mm-hmm. just feeding until the conditions are right. And they know when the when the wind's less than two miles per hour. <clears throat> the humidity is just right, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's a nice, warm, humid night. They know, and all of the termites in a geographic territory will swarm at the same time. Are, are they foraging? Is that the purpose nope. of a swarm? What is they're it? They're primary so reproductive. So is basically, that right? what they do is they're Date night. a mixture yeah. of yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> a mixture of about fifty fifty uh, uh-huh. females and males, yeah. uh, the future kings and queens of new colonies. And what they'll do is they'll sense that the the um, Conditions are just right, the best mm. possible for strong flights, <clears throat> because yeah. they're very weak flyers, so they can't have strong winds. They'll all fly, they'll meet their mate, pair up, and crawl into a little crack and, and start having eggs. Well, I mean, that's a, ter- that's a terrible thing to have so, to talk about. All right, so let's think about it. So if you have mm-hmm. termites in your house, mm-hmm. so you're sitting watching TV and you suddenly notice termite wings fluttering past your mm-hmm. TV, what do you do? Well, if you haven't had your house inspected every year, the first thing to do is schedule an inspection and find yeah. out, do you have the termites inside? Because if yeah. they swarm in inside your house, either a window or door is open and they're getting in, or the swarm is coming from inside. I know a lot of people you've do got them. I, 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 Michael, I know a lot of people do the ostrich move. They just turn the lights out and think they're not there. You know, yeah. they, 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 by turning the lights on, they're driven out of the house. That may be partially true. But you're not seeing all the colony, are you? You're just seeing the ones that are out there trying to have That's a date right. night. You're only, you're only seeing the, the primary reproductors or the wing reproductors. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Well, listen, when that happens, uh, it, Michael reminds mm-hmm. us, and we'll tell you at the end of the show, too, there's two kinds of houses, and, and they're both yours. One's without termites and one that it's just a matter of time before you're going to get them again. That's right. And, and speaking about time, we, we try to make sure that people understand during the program at one point in time every week that there are certain opportunities for employment and everything else. But I 
think today we got to look at the big picture. First of all, I do know that you were looking for some people last week. Yeah. How's, how's that going and what's going on with, the, with openings? So, uh, honestly, it is tough to hire people in Hawaii. I think we have a 3% unemployment rate. Which is pretty good, but that's pretty bad if you're trying it's, to run a business. It's great yeah, for, yeah, a, yeah. for a state, but bad mm, for, mm. Uh, for people that are looking to hire mm-hmm. people. So um, <clears throat> we've actually filled a couple of positions, but uh, we decided that we uh, – we, and we'll get into why we're going to be doing this, but we're actually expanding to the big island. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're also opening a Honolulu ah, branch. Chances and, there. And uh, mm-hmm. so yeah, we've actually got a new position for training managers. We're looking for two training managers, which was an awesome opportunity. I mean, I wish – when I was – a get into this business, I had found an opportunity like mm-hmm. this. And basically, it's a fully paid six-month training program. So mm-hmm. we'll take someone with no experience. All they need is a good attitude and a good work history and uh, clean abstracts. We'll take a person like that and put them through an intensive six-month training program as uh, part of our leadership development program and, and turn them into a supervisor and then into a manager. Yeah, and obviously, folks, this is an investment <clears throat> that, that, that Michael is making into the, the potential of somebody, not their immediate. So you're carrying these guys and gals for a while. I mean, you've got to make, you know, before you put them out in the field, they've got to know what they're doing. Yeah, you know, the cost of turnover in mm-hmm. the company, I'm sure for most small businesses, is, is really, really high. So when, when you consider the cost of recruiting, hiring, training, and all that training time is usually unproductive time. And in this case, yeah. this, just this one job, it's a six-month training. You, you know, it, it's sort of like looking at a special force guy. How many people want to turn out for something and how many end up going to be the right. full, the full on person. So you, you, this is a constant, a constant thing that you're, that you're, it's a dilemma, isn't it? It, it is, it, you know, and sometimes you ask yourself, well, am I just, when, if they leave or when they leave, am I just training my competitors? Future yeah, that's employees? another problem. Isn't and it? so, yeah. you know, for 18 years ago, when I first started, mm-hmm. I used to have that constant battle with myself and be like, man, I, do I want to send this person to this training seminar? And what happens if they leave? And then I would mm-hmm. have just educated my competition on this new product or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the, the, here's yeah. the thing. You have to just commit. Yeah. You have to just say, you know what? I'm committed to growing my business. I'm going to make the most of everything. I'm going to try and make as many people successful as possible. And yes, mm-hmm. I am going to lose some people to my competitors. But in the end, I'm not going to be great unless my people are great. Yeah, and you know, that's, that, the, that's the bottom line, folks. We talk about that a lot. That is really evident in the growth, the the uh, every year double-digit growth that, that, that's been present. But I'm really concerned for one thing on your behalf and others that are struggling uh, in, in small business just like you are, and that is – there, there are conditions way beyond your control that cut into the bottom line. And one of them that you said is that you're spending so much time on the road these days that there's you, your guys just it, it comes right off the bottom line, and there's no way to uh, get away from it because the guy's going to be in traffic no matter what happens. Mike, this is not just traffic. This is traffic madness. Mm-hmm. Th- yeah, this, no kidding. We're at a point right now where this is this is actually madness. We ran some numbers. <clears throat> so we looked at our numbers, and our, our profit and loss was not – our profit was not where it should have been. Mm-hmm. But everything else was in not alignment. Big volume. You know, you, you got, you're controlling you got, your expenses, except one goes out of control. Everything by the yeah. book. Mm-hmm. Our expenses are all where they should be. Mm-hmm. And then we started looking at our, our, – it's called employee utility. Mm-hmm. And employee utility, <clears throat> we calculate by looking at the total hours an employee – clocked in for the day. So he starts at 8 in the morning, finishes at 5 in the afternoon, took an hour lunch break. So that's eight hours. And then you look at how many hours he was actually in front of customers earning money. And that becomes a percentage. So our target utilization is if a person works 10 hours, we want seven hours in front of a customer. Yeah, 7%. in other words, you, you already know that 30% of their time is it's getting from time. point A to B. Exactly, right, right. or meeting times or whatever it might be. So we know that 70% is where we want mm-hmm. to be. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so... We had our CFO take a look at our numbers. I could not understand. We're, we're doing everything we could, mm-hmm. scheduling productively. And uh, we found that our employee utility was less than 50%. Ah, now, so, so that now, number, instead of being 30, it's 50. So three months yeah. ago, yeah. it was at, at 70% consistently. Mm-hmm. The last three months, it's been dropping down. Now it's at 50%. Yeah. Yeah. So we thought, how the hell is this possible? We're still servicing the same customers mm-hmm. with the same people. What I'm worried and, about, Michael, if you're discovering that right now, and this is a time when most schools are on break, that, my goodness, you would think, think well, in summertime it's going to be opposite, and in, in fact it's not. Well, think about this. This mm-hmm. is exactly what we found. Mm-hmm. We found that we averaged 60 vehicles on the road every day. Mm-hmm. So 60 drivers on the vehicle every day, and each vehicle, according to the GPS, is averaging 45 minutes delay each way to the office. That's 90 90 minutes minutes a day. Not drive time. This Mm -hmm. is delay time. 
owing to this absolute Pearl City traffic mm. madness. That equals 90 hours lost in traffic yeah. per day. Now, and now, by the way, it, don't get out a calculator here because you'll slit your wrist. I mean, you know, well, I, I don't know how you're staying no, together. Okay. So I did, yeah, I did yeah. take it. Okay. Check this let, out. Let, Check this out. So this is fact, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm just a small little company. Like, you can imagine the large companies and how many companies mm-hmm. like this are, are going through this. And you can tell I'm getting kind of worked up because I'm really boiling about this whole thing. The total payroll expense lost every single day because of the Pearl City traffic mm-hmm. is 2000 Two hundred and fifty dollars per day. Yeah, this is not just pulled out of the sky, folks. That's, this is this is a management study that's been this, done. That's that's our actual loss per day, mm. which is eleven thousand two hundred fifty dollars a week, forty eight thousand dollars a month, and five hundred and eighty thousand a year. Okay, that's a half a million dollars. Now here, thrown away. a lot of people would say, "Well, the fix is just charge more money," but that's not the that's not the philosophy of the company. In other words, you set your expend your your charges based on an expected profit and it's it's a understandable reasonable profit if you try to pump that number up at the expense of a customer you're not going to have the business well that's exactly yeah. it i mean what we try to do is we try to be fair and and certainly charge within what the market can bear mm-hmm. and we feel like we we charge a we have a premium service we charge a, a fair price for a premium mm-hmm. service now <clears throat> this unexpected nightmare as a result of the traffic is going to is really going to impact our business. So yeah. we looked at what are the options. Yeah, well, increase. I was going to say what I know that you've you've concentrated and spent a lot of time. What have you identified as part of the fix? Okay, so first thing you have to do is you have to do something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because if you don't, don't you, just oh, whoa, imagine it's me. if we if we. A year's time, we lost $585,000 on this. It comes with our bottom yeah, line. I yeah. worked the, my entire company's worked the whole year for nothing, so yeah. we make $2 yeah. profit. <laughs> you know? yeah. And so these are the things. You, you, so I think mm. in a situation like this, you have to do something. Mm-hmm. So we're going to do this. We are going to have all of our employees take vehicles home. So we've already invested in GPS and handle mm-hmm. technology for right. every employee. Every employee takes a vehicle home, and they don't necessarily have to come to the office anymore. Mm. We're, we're going to... Develop, we're developing two managers right now where they're actually going to be field managers who don't check in at the office. Mm-hmm. They actually meet in, in Honolulu or in Waikiki and they, they'll check all the Waikiki guys in yeah. that day. And um, all the Windward guys will check in on the Windward side at, at a, some public location somewhere in the morning rather than come to the office. Well, bless and technology to make, this, to, to, vehic- to make this happen. Back in the day, you know, with, with pay phones and, and things, this couldn't have been done. Honestly, Mike, it's not perfect because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when, when when you're trying to create uniformity, the best way to have uniformity is to have uniform meetings where everyone is at the same place at the same time. Sure. So everyone gets the same message. So now it makes it more of a challenge because now you have to make sure that that same message is being taken out by each manager and and translated the exact same way. Yeah, and, and, and th- therefore you're giving up control. Yeah, yeah I mean, so, you, you know. So yeah. uh, it's a challenge, but there's no other option. You, you simply cannot afford to lose that much money in traffic every day. Um, sadly, we've been trying very hard to get this additional office space. Mm-hmm. And we finally you're got growing. office space. You need more space, sure. We finally got the lease, and we're walking away from it mm-hmm. because we're not going to invest in Pill City anymore. Mm-hmm. We can't grow in Pill City because we can't afford the loss – as a result yeah. of the traffic. So think how that impacts taxes. So we, our expenses mm-hmm. are going to go up $585,000 this year. Okay. That's so, all going to come out of taxes. So you say that's Pearl City, but it's, it's really probably a lot of other places too. Are there some areas that you've identified without being specific that it would be that these numbers would, 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 re, would, would decrease? Well, the, the, the traffic madness in Pearl City is caused by this rail. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it is unbelievable to me that they will shut down entire roads with not a single person working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. It's frustrating. There's no one there. There's yeah. like a four-lane road now, a one-lane road, but no one's working. I'll tell you what gets it's me. Ridiculous. I, let me tell you what gets me. I understand the need for safety. I really do. So when somebody's working on the road, they need to be protected. But I can't believe sometimes there seems to be a mile of cones before you get to the job site. And I'm thinking they, 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 they put ridiculous. them up, they take them down, they cause inconvenience, and the problem, you don't, can't even see it. And who's given the permits? I was driving on, on so traffic in Pill City, traffic out of Pill City. We were yeah. driving on the highway to get away. And uh, they had the highway shut down. There were three lanes of the highway shut down, and there was one tree uh, cutting crew 
So one one crew yeah. cutting a tree, but there's probably a thousand cars in the traffic jam, <laughs> whilst two guys are slowly cutting a tree. Oh, yeah, 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 so, yeah. But but anyway, so this this whole traffic thing, I would actually like to get involved in in some sort yeah. of traffic remediation because this is whoever's making these decisions, they need to start rethinking their decisions. They need to have some small business people saying, you know what really happened in here? We have a problem, and you need to help fix it. Well, think about half yeah. a million dollars a year in expenses just for yeah. us. We're a tiny little company. Now, can you imagine times up by how many companies? Well, let's, are, let's just go just ten companies your size. That's that's uh, five million dollars. Yeah, and I think, you know, that, yeah. think of the impact yeah. to the state and mm-hmm. lost revenues because that's all going to be a tax deductible expense. Of course. It's a loss, right? So, you know, what's the tax that they're losing on that? Yep. So, well, listen, um, we're not going to solve that, but we're going to solve some other things. We're going to go back and talk about some big things like mozzies and roaches and some of the other stuff. Um, and and Michael spent a little bit of time in the emergency room last week, which is probably never any fun. We're going to talk about that as we continue here on What's Bugging You. And remember, you can find out all you need to know about what's bugging you and how to fix that by going to SandwichIsle.com. That's SandwichIsle.com. At Sandwich Isle, we believe the best way to protect your home from unwanted pests is not through control, but through prevention. Pest prevention is a unique concept perfected by Sandwich Isle in 1997. Over the years, we have continued to improve our service effectiveness with the many technological advances in our industry. Today, Sandwich Isle's pest prevention is recognized as one of the most environmentally responsible and effective approaches in the industry. Expect more and get it with Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Why do you need pest prevention? My home is very important to me. The last thing I want to worry about are bugs and centipedes around my wife and kids. Your home is your castle. Our customers want to keep their homes free of unwanted pests. That's why they hire Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. There are many homes out there that are going to get rodents. We used to live in fear of centipedes and roaches. You need to protect your house, and Sandwich Isle protects ours. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it. Okay, so the music was not exactly developed for Sandwich Isle, but it's pretty much on the spot, La Cucaracha. We, we try to talk on this program about everything, uh, and the, the list of things that are called pests are, are long, and, and it's just something that we have to live with, but maybe not as, as bad as you think. Uh, you ended up in the emergency room because of the, these horrible little midges that bit you, and it gave you a renewed appreciation of what <coughs> folks like your customers and clients go through. But, I mean, you know... Uh, Today, I'm, I'm, we have a horrific, you know, he, Michael has a traffic problem. We have a parking problem. We don't have a traffic problem. We have a so I'm downstairs waiting for Michael to come, and, and he gets out of his car and shows me a, a little Good trap that, 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 for heaven's sakes, the pest control guru has pests in his car. <laughs> How embarrassing. What happened? So the reason I want to talk about this is because... If it happens to me, it's got to be happening to other people. Absolutely. And, and we yeah. definitely get calls on this all the time. So so, so this is a situation, mm-hmm. right? I don't allow my children to eat in my car. Mm-hmm. I don't Which eat is in my bad car. news for fast food restaurants because that's where most of it comes from, <laughs> that's right? right. Yeah. So I don't eat in my car. My mm-hmm. kids don't eat in my car. I keep my car clean. And occasionally I pick up things. So mm-hmm. recently I picked up 800 pounds of corn because I had to deliver it to a, a, a one of our uh, feral pig feed sites. Right. And uh, one of the bags was was torn, and I taped it before I put it in my car. But there was one one red flag. There's and, the food source. Uh, I pick up dog food. Mm-hmm. I go shopping at Costco or Sam's sure. Club, and we I, I grab yeah. those boxes of the line mm-hmm. outside to pack all my food in. Anyway, so the other day, um, I was with my di- my wife for dinner, and we get back to the car, and there's a cockroach, uh, uh, like walking right near my gear shift. Yeah, and uh, so I'm like, that's a deal breaker. I, I cannot believe that's a deal breaker so, with no, the wife, she didn't right? Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, 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 I'm out of here. About the taxi, yeah. she nearly caught a taxi. You know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you know, I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is interesting. What I'm going to do mm-hmm. is I'm going to put blue boards down mm-hmm. for a week. I'm going to put a food attractant and see if I can capture them because there's okay. no food in my car. They've got to be attracted. So after one week and four blue boards, I now have 13 cockroaches caught. Okay, 13 cockroaches. But you know what they the, say about cockroaches in your house? If you see one on the kitchen counter, there's 50,000 behind so, the wall. So imagine yeah. this. Yeah. I have two different species of cockroaches oh, no. in my car. And so it, it just is amazing to me. So how does this happen? Well, mm. cockroaches only get into cars 
there's a couple of different ways. Either they fly in, mm-hmm. so the large American roaches or the German right. roaches, or they crawl in because your windows are open, which is sometimes what I do. I leave mine cracked a little so it doesn't mm-hmm. get too hot. Um, or they get brought in with, with boxes or, sure. or goods or whatever you're yeah. picking up. So <clears throat> the key thing to think about is how do you keep cockroaches out of your car? Well, the key thing is that you shouldn't have any food in your car. Yeah, you can't tent your car every night when you get home either, right? That, that's yeah, any, yeah. But, so don't eat in your car. But even if you don't eat in your car, like in my case, you could still get cockroaches in your car. So um, what do you need to do to keep the cockroaches out? Well, anything that you bring inside your car potentially could harbor cockroaches. And mm-hmm. if you're going to pick up a box, make sure you know where that box comes from and make sure that you get it out of your car as quickly as you put it in your car. Yeah, and you Don't know what, there, there's, or, there's no real way to really monitor that. You might think you're monitoring it. But, you might think but it. But, yeah, I mean, you, you've often explained that, you know, these little bugs, they'll get inside a carton where you will not see them. It's amazing. Yeah, they'll take yeah. advantage of any opportunity yeah, yeah. they can. But mm. the, the thing about it is, is you can't leave it because if you leave it, what do cockroaches do best? They breed. And pretty soon you've got two species of cockroaches and 13, <laughs> 13 caught in traps. Um, like, like I have. So what, what I've yeah, done, what, what are you going to do, though? Because mm-hmm. a lot of people are afraid to spray some kind of chemical in their car in case it's toxic. So if you've identified the problem, you know, you're, you're a solution type guy. How do you get rid of them? Well, the first part for me was interest, and I mm-hmm. wanted to see how many I had and, and, and where they were. And, so it's, uh, the first so part is science The first part you. is yeah, interest. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I've figured it out. So now mm-hmm. I've baited them. So basically the, the key thing is you don't want to put a bait on the actual car. Because the cars heat up when you're not in them sometimes, mm-hmm. and the bait will melt and stain. And yes. you don't want to spray an aerosol or a, a liquid because as your car heats up, it volatilizes, then you end up yeah. breathing in yeah. that stuff. And also it could mess up with the surfaces. So what I recommend is get in an insect monitoring device like the one I showed you, which right. is basically it's, a, it's, a folded-up glue board mm-hmm. so you can't put your foot in it. Mm-hmm. It's covered yeah, on top. Yeah, yeah. And then get a bait and put it on the edges of the glue board. And that seems to be working really good because they're attracted to mm-hmm. the scent of the bait, then they get caught in the glue board. And if they eat the bait, they're going to die too. Uh, so, is, it, uh, is there light at the end of the tunnel? I mean, you know, once yeah. you've identified it, uh, what, what period of time would you expect that you get most of them to get on the blue, glue board and, and get rid of them? I think if you use that technique that I'm mm-hmm. talking about, which I think is probably the best way to go, <clears throat> I would personally not recommend spraying inside a car. Yeah, I was thinking um, the same You could thing. tent your car. We often mm-hmm. do that yeah, for people yeah. who have mm-hmm. bed bugs in their car. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tenting's great. And 24 hours later, everything's Hey, dead. by the way, uh, how do you do that? Because we know we, we've talked about how you do a house. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing you have a, a system of weights and, and, it, and it, perform, it, it, it makes a seal with the ground somehow? Yeah, so typically people fumigate their cars at our facility. Mm-hmm. And uh, they'll drive the car in. And uh, we'll put down a, a tarpaulin underneath the car. Okay. <clears throat> they drive the car over the tarpaulin, and then we cover it with uh, those moving blankets. That right, right, sure. And then we throw a real light visqueen, which is uh, like six mil plastic. Yeah. We'll throw that over the, the car and connect it to the tarpaulin under the car. So it's uh, basically entirely enveloped in, in airtight mm-hmm. canvas or, or plastic. Yeah. And then you inject a gas into that. And uh, basically, you. you well, what, what's way. the worst you've ever seen? I mean, as far as someone comes, hey, help me! I'm, my, my car's full of bugs. Help me! Yeah, you know, we've had some fire engines that were pretty bad. Yeah, um, we've had uh, ambulances. Um, and not bad. I mean, not not as bad as some private cars. The yeah, but you would expect in an ambulance. Please don't have a yeah. roach in the ambulance. I it's mean, a, you know, it's, yeah. it's a it's a it's yeah. usually a low. Uh, mm-hmm. There's only a few uh, bugs in that. The worst I've ever seen is bed bugs in a car where there was a torn seat and there were literally thousands of them yeah. inside the seats. And so generally when that happens, it's someone who's not affected by the bite. And then mm. somebody, maybe they die or something, somebody else goes to get the car and they just covered it. What, in is, what is the, the treatment for bed bugs we've, we've <clears> known <throat> before is, is heat related. I mean, you often will say, you, you know. know. You know, uh, things have actually improved uh, mm-hmm. so much. Uh, technology's improved so much that we've actually moved beyond heat now. Mm-hmm. And so... Initially, we pioneered the use of heat for bed bugs because the pesticides that were available were not killing the bed bugs. Yeah. What happened was, we think it goes back to um, in the some of the third world countries where there's a lot of bed bugs and there's a lot of use of insect nets. So um, you, the UN throws out these insect nets all mm, over the world, yeah, yeah, everywhere, which sure. are treated with pyrethrins. Okay, okay, so it's a man-made pyrethrum. <clears throat> so imagine this. All of these bed bugs that live in close proximity to beds encounter low doses of pyrethrin. So they're building up immunity. And have offspring that's now immune to Oh, my heavens. Okay, so yeah. go back 10 years ago when bed bugs first came back in America, 
97% of all of the pesticides labeled for use against bedbugs were pyrethrin. But as it turned out, most of this new resurgence of bedbugs was pyrethrin resistant. Yeah, just laughing at it. Or pyrethrin yeah. avert. So they actually avoided pyrethrin. And so they would know where it was, and they would just mm. walk around it. I know that we could do a whole program just on bed bugs, but you said something that just really caught my ear a minute ago, and that is the resurgence of them. I mean, at one point in time, it, it was kind of thought to be handled, and, and now they're back with a vengeance. And so there must be people, you know, in your, in your, uh, in your milieu, in the, in the industry, that are really concentrating on what's the advanced next way to deal with this issue, because it's a big issue. Yeah, it is a big issue, Mike. And here's here's what I see as being the biggest problem in Hawaii. So bedbugs are probably the most expensive pest to eradicate. Very, wow. very expensive because it's so labor intensive, mm-hmm. equipment intensive, and you can't make any mistakes. Um, so there's some liability involved for us as well. Sure. And so it's one of the most expensive services. So it turns out that the people who are least able to afford those services actually have the worst infestations. So yeah, see, that's, with, so, that's so, so awful when you think about it. Yeah, you know? so yeah. We, we call them, I, I call them urban reservoirs. Mm-hmm. So urban reservoirs are these low-income housing areas where they just don't have the money for it. And so mm-hmm. you have these poor people who can't afford the service, who have the worst possible situation. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and what do they do? They go to public places, and that's how they get reinfested. So we know, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of restaurants where they've been – really badly infested and consistently so by one or two people who are probably really low income people as it turns out mm-hmm. and, you know they actually identified who these people were that were coming in during happy hour to get you know, starters for sure, sure. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and um, the, the problem is is those people would go back and they come back the next day with and they bring more yeah. and so that, that's a real big problem and so until we solve that problem I don't see this problem ever getting fixed i think it's going to continue and i think if you then globalize that problem Mm. it's even worse in the third world countries well isn't that some respect why we've talked about this in previous shows and we should really mention it that standard style pest solutions is also not just about eradication but management and and sometimes that's the best you can do you're not going to be able to really eradicate it but you can make it a little more tolerable yeah so for example hotels many of our hotel clients they'll have a preventative inspection mm-hmm. so they'll have their rooms on a, on a on a scheduled rotation where they have a person coming and inspecting them and what we do is we actually put interceptors in there that have an attractant in them mm-hmm. so even though we don't see anything you you find we have sure. interceptors in there we come back a week later and check them and sometimes even though you saw nothing you know you have three bed bugs in yeah there. so a lot of a lot of hotels do that and then using encasements encasements are awesome for your mattresses and your box springs the great thing about encasements is, is that you don't have to lose your mattress or box spring in the event that it gets infested with bed bugs. A lot of people throw all of their furniture away if it has bed bugs. So you don't ever have to do that. You can always treat the furniture. You can tent fumigate it. And if it's a bed or a mattress, a box mm-hmm. spring, you can actually get an encasement that will encase the bed bugs in the mattress. They won't be able to get any yeah. food and they'll die. Yeah, I'm telling you, folks, this is a an ongoing problem, and, and we're going to talk about it a lot. The main thing is, though, if, if you just get into the mix, and you can do that one of two ways. You can go to sandwichisle.com, or you can call 456-7716. Talk to a human and, and get something scheduled for your place right away, because the quicker you get a handle on what the problem is, the quicker you get it at a solution. That's why it's called Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. We come back, we got to spend some more time with those miserable little mosquitoes, because they're in the news again. At Sandwich Isle, we believe the best way to protect your home from unwanted pests is not through control, but through prevention. Pest prevention is a unique concept perfected by Sandwich Isle in 1997. Over the years, we have continued to improve our service effectiveness with the many technological advances in our industry. Today, Sandwich Isle's pest prevention is recognized as one of the most environmentally responsible and effective approaches in the industry. Expect more and get it with Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Why choose Sandwich Isle's pest prevention over pest control? The last thing I want to worry about are bugs and centipedes around my wife and kids. At Sandwich Isle, we believe in pest prevention, not pest control. The bottom line is we want to prevent these pests from getting into your house in the first place. We look at things like caulking and sealing gaps, holes and cracks around your house. We do a lot of things that are different, that don't involve any pesticides whatsoever. I love Sandwich Isle. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it.
Yeah, it's kind of in a way you don't want to do the cube, you know, the, the cupid shuffle. You want the guys from Sandwich Hall Best Solutions. And, and by the way, when I say guys, I really want to make sure you understand something. And I think this is really cool. Uh, Michael, over the years, I've met some really, really Akamai bright, educated, smart females. You have an equal opportunity employment base. And for some reason, you would think that women would run away from that industry, but you find out that they get passionate about really helping their customers. You, you know, some of our best employees are, are women. Yeah. And I wish we could get more women in them because I, I think women um, just seem to have a knack mm-hmm. for trying to make people happy. And so they, they're great in a home. I think one of the reasons is that that a little bit is not good enough. Most women say, if there's one roach, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it, and I'm going to get them all. In other words, it's say, well, you don't see them anymore. You're okay. Guys will say, well, I don't see them. Women will say, they're in there somewhere. I'm going to go find them. Yeah, you know, and, and it's not the – I think a lot of people have a stereotype about pest management and mm-hmm. that it's a, it's a man's world. It's really not. Uh, I, I think it's dominated by men, but women are just – can just as easily succeed, uh, mm. whether it be in in the service field or in the management field or with the administration field. You know, there's so many that, opportunities for them. Part of that, Michael, I'm sorry, it comes from uh, th- there being moms, you know, and they're being dealing with kids that got a, a you know red ant bite or a mosquito bite or a rash or something, and they're just. You know, they're going to do everything they can to protect whoever, whether it's a family member or a customer, they, from having that experience. Yeah, I think, you, I think you're right. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm really pleased that we've got the, the women yeah. who, who work with us, and I think they're, they're awesome. In fact, I'm so proud of Arlene, our, our new office manager. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was, yeah. She you know, was just nominated. Yeah. She's one of the 12, so the National Pest Management Association. In the country. She's one of the 12 people who oversee the professional pest yeah. management. Uh, pr- professional woman in pest management. And I bet you can't and kid her about anything. She no, just she's probably, awesome. She I mean, knows she's, it. She and she knows started yeah. from the very yeah. bottom, worked her way up, and you know, she's one of our managers now. But um, it, it's awesome that she actually okay. has a – she's going to be in, in D.C. and Capitol Hill for a week. Wow. With our legislators and congressmen. No, it's, it's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, okay. You know, slapping mosquitoes, if you're really good, is okay. Um, I've, I've seen people swat at them with fly swatters and everything else. But you, you really have to take a more proactive uh, stance on this. So let's talk about this. Be, you know, they, they're causing a lot of problems right now. They've been in the news. Once they get in the news, then people find them, and they find more and more of them. Let's talk about what some of the things people can do to either control or manage or eradicate them. All right. So... I think the single most important thing that you can do to keep mosquitoes out of your house is to have good screens. Mm -hmm. So um, I I know I've I've heard some screen company on your. uh, Yeah, well, we we like there's a lot there's a lot of them. Some of the hardware uh, stores do it. Some of the big boxes do it. Uh, City Mill does it, and and we know that screens and things they're a great company. In other words, there's a lot of ways you can get help with that. We do. You know, my wife and I fix our own screens with Mm -hmm. with kids and dogs and things. Yeah, because they're going to bust every day anyway. So. Um, you know, they, it's inexpensive to do it, mm-hmm. but it makes such a big difference. The, do you have the little the little wheel and the yep, little rubber strips exactly. and all that stuff? That's, yeah. It's not bad. And, the, and yeah. the spare mesh <laughs> when a dog runs through. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the uh, screens are probably the most important, not mm-hmm. just for mosquitoes, but pretty much any flying insect, including sw- swarming termites. So I, I think if there's one thing you're going to do, um, that would be uh, make sure that your screens are tight-fitting, that they, if they're damaged, repair them, and that your doors are closed or you have a screen door open. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, most people in Hawaii, they have their screen, you know, th- their screen doors stay open all year the time. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that's great. Just make sure that they, the screens are in good shape. It, is there anything more irritating than trying to go to sleep at night and hearing that zzz, you know? <laughs> your, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, and, and like I said before, they don't bite me, but my poor wife, if there's one mosquito in our house, it's going to find her. Well, just and tell her it's a female. She'll feel better about <laughs> it because it's not the males that are biting. <laughs> but, but, but I mean, seriously, this is a big concern. So yeah. what you're talking about is, Certainly, the first line of defense are your screens. First line of defense, yeah. I, I believe, is the screens. Mm-hmm. If, if, there were, if that's the only thing that you did, that would make a huge impact on mosquitoes being in your house. The next thing is you have to consider that all flies, including mosquitoes, breed rapidly. Mm-hmm. So you have to try and find the source and control the source. Now, mosquitoes prefer to breed in, in water. And so they go through four life stages. And at the first stage, the egg gets laid in the water. And then the larval stages are all in the water. It's only yep. the adult that emerges. <clears throat> so if you remove water and damp areas in your yard, that's going to make a huge impact. Okay. We've talked the other day about your least favorite plant, the bromeliad, yep. you know, because they're water collectors. But I also have a friend who has a kid, and the kid got into off-roading. 
and he had all these tires around, and he had tires around the back, and he just stashed them. He didn't want his father to see how much the tires had worn down, so he hide them. But when it rains, <laughs> they fill up with water. Isn't that like a, that's exactly, a little bird yeah, bath that's, that's for the, the, that's for the mosquitoes? The things. Actually, it's so hard to get water out of a tire. I don't yeah, know yeah, it, like it really you, is. You know? when, you leave the, when you leave the tire... Outside, he gets water in it, yep. and uh, you flip it over, the water goes to the other side. <laughs> it's like you flip it over 100 times before yeah. it comes out. But that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. So don't leave the tires mm-hmm. outside where they can get it because once that water gets in there, because it's so hard to get out, um, it'll probably stay in there. And and the the day-biting mosquitoes particularly mm-hmm. really, really um, like to um, breed in clear yeah. water. You know, I learned something once the hard way a long time ago, and I'm sure others out there have had the same experience. One of my boats at one time had a major engine issue, and it was it, it was going to be laid up for a while. So I had it uh, on a trailer and, and sort of sticking nose up in the air so the water would drain out. Little did I know that leaves and stuff got into that oh, man. thing, and the whole hull of the boat filled up with water, oh. and there were a billion mosquitoes in oh, there. Man. I was so embarrassed because my neighbors were getting bitten, and, they, and they, <laughs> they sent vector control around, and they said, oh, Mr. Buck, it's your yard. I said, oh, how embarrassing that was. It was a nightmare to fix. It does yeah. get out of hand, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, so yeah. quickly, too, because yeah. they breed so quickly. You know, in just a few days or just a, just a week or so, you've got thousands and thousands of mosquitoes flying yeah. around. And so, you know, the, the thing is, is is find all those areas that are collecting water. And some sometimes it might just be one source. Mm-hmm. It might be one can of paint that was left out and just the water on the top that's gathered yeah. maybe a quarter of an inch deep. And, you know, there's just thousands of mosquitoes in there. I know that uh, my, our good friend uh, Andy Dietrich, from uh, from uh, Geobunga, they have a lot of water features and things, and and water lilies and whatnot. Uh, that's a problem, isn't it? I mean, you you know, we used in ours, we use these little guppies, and they fish that he seen. Yeah, so that's that's a know? great point. So yeah. you get uh, mosquito eating fish. That, so it's, they're not eating the adults; they're eating the larva. Mm-hmm. And so you Which can is what you, need you can get do, mosquito right? eating fish. Basically, if you have a pond or a turtle pond or mm-hmm. something like that, um, you definitely need to get those little fish to eat the larva, uh, because. It's much easier to control them that way than it is to treat the water all the time. Are, are you sort of, you, what you're really saying here is that you're not going to be able to eradicate them from your entire neighborhood. But you can protect the inside of your house with screens, and, and then you can take a look outside at things like standing mm-hmm. water. What else? So the other thing is we, we offer a seasonal mosquito control program. Mm-hmm. And so the key thing with mosquitoes is you have control, to break that talking. cycle. Yeah. You have to stop that breeding cycle. So the, 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 the service consists of these two things. Number one. Find the source and treat the source. Now, the source is normally treated with a larvicide. Mm-hmm. Because remember, it goes through four different life stages, egg, larva, pupa, adult. It's a complete metamorphosis. And so the, the key part is to get to the part that's easy to get to, which is when they're a larva, they're in the water. So there's a, a larvicide that you can water. apply yeah. mm-hmm. in a granular form. And basically, it kills them in the water or it kills them in the damp soil. So that's the first part of the program. The second part of the program is what do the adults do? Well, the adults, let's say you have a lanai. They fly, and they'll land on the ornamental plants around your lanai mm-hmm. and wait for you to come out and have your beer. Oh, boy. And so they're, they're always sitting your in the same place. Your happy hour is also their happy <laughs> hour, right? Oh, so so no. they sit there, they yeah. wait for you to come outside, and you, you sit down, and they see you. They are attracted by heat, mm. by scent, and by CO2. So mm. as you exhale, they're like, oh, there's my Yeah, they, they come. Yep. And so they'll come, they'll feed on you. So now they're so bloated. The female yeah. mosquitoes have got their blood meal. They're so bloated and fill. That they can't fly. It's just like a giant airplane that's overloaded with fuel. It can't fly very far. So what do they do? They fly to the, the, that nearby ornamental plant and, and they hang sit out. there and yeah. they just hang out and they wait to digest that blood. So by treating those areas, the resting areas, it's very, very effective because you intercept them yeah. coming in and going out. And so that program that we're talking about covers both of those areas, and it's, it's extremely and, and, effective. And, and, folks, you got to know your limitations. you got to know what your pay grade is, and you got to know when to call the expert. So you can find out more about this, these pests and others, at sandwichisle.com, or easier yet, 456-7716. We leave you with a parting message today. Can't get rid of mosquitoes. And you probably can't get rid of termites because there's only two kinds of houses, right? That's right. Those, uh, there's two types of houses in Hawaii, those that have termites and those that will get termites. And so if you haven't scheduled your annual inspection, 
Do it now. Yep. And by the way, uh, do what we do. Get that Centricon, this new new Centricon system we have. Oh, it's it's just absolutely wonderful. Yeah. We hope you've enjoyed it. If you if you want to know more, uh, I, I, I invite you to go to sandwichisle.com. That's sandwichisle.com. Or call them up at 456-7716. Uh, and remember, what's bugging you is brought to you by Michael Both and the friends at Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. We'll see you next time. So nothing's bugging you. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. And if something is bugging you, jump online and get debugged at sandwichisle.com. That's sandwichisle.com.